If he's been good to you, can you do it right now? If with a grateful heart, not with grudging, not because you have to, because you love him. Come on. Come on. Some of you have praised him all day. He's worthy. Let's do it. Contemplating the Lord's Prayer and the template for our prayer. I'm going to tell you something. If you'll pray, you'll make it. No matter what kind of storm you're going through, if you pray, you'll make it. I feel in the Holy Ghost, somebody said, well, I tried, Brother Elder. Well, you got to keep trying. You got to pray your way through the storm. And as I was praying, contemplating the template of the Lord's Prayer, it came to me that when you worship, worship is not an individual thing. Worship is, is a corporate thing. Now you can worship in a car by yourself. But David said, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. That's a corporate thing. Jesus said, When you pray, you say, Our Father. He's our Father. He doesn't disclude anybody. Now, the group you may be in may disclude, but God doesn't disclude anybody. Our Father. That's corporate worship. But repentance is individual. David said, against thee and thee alone, God, have I sinned. Repentance is like eating. Nobody can eat for you. They can push a steak in front of you and say, come on, eat. You're going you're to get sick if you don't eat, but you got to eat. They can push water in front of you and say, come on, you're not going to make it if you don't drink. But you got to drink. Jesus said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. He's not talking about cannibalism. He's talking about the health of you have to partake of me. You can't leave it to mama to pray for you. You can't leave it to daddy 
Daddy can't repent for you. Oh. But if you will. He said, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet. They shall be white as snow. There's a special touch of the Lord that's in this place today. Can we lift our hands and give him another high praise? Come on, let's lift our voice. Don't just lift your hands. Let's lift our voice. It's your voice that is the sacrifice. The fruit of our lips, that is the sacrifice of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. My heart is so full from this week. And we'll talk a little bit about it tonight. But it was such a powerful, powerful move of the Lord at, at Double Portion this week. And uh, if you missed it, you can catch it online. Just go to CGC Pueblo live. Or you can download the app. CGC Pueblo it has a better feed anyway than YouTube. And you don't have to put up all the stupid advertisements. And uh, Brother Azar ministered so marvelous. And then uh, Pastor Ryder, what a word from God. And then, my goodness, did Brother Claiborne speak to this generation. And Brother Charles blew it out of the water. If you want to overcome temptation and learn how to pray, go listen to that message by Pastor Greg Charles. What a wonderful, wonderful move of God. I'm going to guess there were probably 350 young people here Friday night. And this place was rocking. And I want to say this. I'll talk more about this a little bit this evening. But I want to thank Brother Richard. Just a superlative job with the music. I want to thank Brother Maceo. We have one of the finest sound men in Pentecost. Thank you, Brother Maceo. Brother Jordan, the media was incredible. We appreciate that. Media is important. It's where the word medium comes from. That's how you transfer communication. And I want to thank Brother Jeffrey and Sister Caitlin are not here. But they just did a fantastic job putting this whole thing together. They are ministering in our sister church in Greeley today. And uh, all of the young people, Sister Melody showed up. I don't, know how, I don't know how many times I came to this church and she had them up in her Sunday school class and she was snapping the whip. And you could tell it in the vocals. They were phenomenal this year. <laughs> Praise God. And I think it was Brother Excel and Sister Charlotte. Were they overseeing the hospitality room? I, I couldn't hardly even fit in this suit this week. That chicanery board they had. No, no, that's not what it's called. <laughs> Is that a charcuterie? Is, how do they say that? <laughs> uh, whatever it was, that was fantastic. I was grazing that thing like a cow. Praise God. And then, I don't know who headed up the meals at the Donna Cordova Center. Sister Juana, I don't see her this morning. There's a lot of sickness. I rebuke that sickness in Jesus' name. Thank you, Sister Juana, for the incredible meals every night at the Donna Cordova Center for everybody. And all of the games and stuff. And... And I think Brother Jeffrey and Sister Caitlin Elder just did a phenomenal job overseeing all of this. And we will let them know that. Amen. Praise God. 
I, uh, I know I'm taking a little time this morning, but I'm getting older. You've got to give me some leeway here. Uh, this engine runs as strong as it ever has. It just don't run quite as fast. And uh, uh, I want to say this morning how absolutely delighted that we are to have all of our guests and our visitors with us here this morning. Amen. It's so wonderful to have the Julian Costello, Costello family with us. God bless you. So honored that you've come to be with us today. And I walked in, and shock of all shocks, there was Sister Tammy. And I am so happy to see her today. And Izzy and Brother Tim Williams, we're so thrilled that you all are here today. And uh, I am just, I am a debtor to the Lord because of his people. I will never take for granted the privilege and the honor that God has given me to, to know you wonderful people. And I was so proud of this church this week as you ministered before the Lord. And I wished all of them were here. There's a lot of people sick today, but you know... It's just like the devil. You know how we can whoop him? We ought to just have church today that just stomps all over his head. And I believe we're going to. And I really felt in the Holy Ghost to ask Brother and Sister Ryder to stay over with us for the weekend. And, and that always puts a preacher in a tough place because people have poured themselves all week but I'll tell you this brother Ryder normally the, the weekend after the torch and after double portion we have church we've already had church around here we're going to have some more church and uh, it used to bother me when I was a young man because you know you want everybody to be there you want to show your best face and invariably when you have a guest preacher 40-50 people don't show up but I've come to the conclusion the Lord is here and I'm here and you're here we just have church and we've got a new person that's decided to be a part of the body of Christian Growth Center brother Aaron Johnson which I am just so happy that God has brought brother Aaron I have known this young man all his life. <laughs> and he is a fine young man, and it's just an honor that he has chosen to make Pueblo his home. And we're thrilled to have him, make him feel welcome. Amen. So we're all here. God can move. He's already moving, but he wants to do a great thing here. Praise God. Brother and Sister Ryder, we're so happy you're here. And, and Baudry and Gent, Gentry. But we call him Gent. Or is it just Gent? Just Gent. Okay, Gent. All right. And there are no more appropriate names for Pueblo than Baudry and Gent. <laughs> and we're so thrilled to have them. I was so disappointed that we, we didn't get to hear Sister Ryder sing Friday night. I heard her in here practice, and I was in my office, and I thought, oh, my Lord, who is that? So hopefully we got that on the schedule to sing tonight. Lord willing, if Jesus comes, who gives a rip? We'll let her sing it up in heaven. Praise God. But we're so thrilled to have Brother and Sister Ryder. We, we, we want them to come. Now, there's one more thing I got. I, am I baptizing Brother David this morning or tonight? Tonight. <laughs> Little DJ got the Holy Ghost. In fact, I know of three that got the Holy Ghost this week. A double portion. 
It's revival time in Pueblo, Colorado. Praise God. Now, I know I've kind of taken my time, but I wanted to take the time to let this church know how much I appreciate you supporting Double Portion. And uh, it's just going to grow. And so uh, I do appreciate this church being on board and Christian Life Church in uh, Greeley. And they were a huge help to us. And I appreciate that so much. Brother Ryder, that message you gave Thursday night was, was definitely a word for the hour. And I don't, I, I've known the writers through the years here and there, but we've never really got the time to spend together like we have this weekend. And sometimes when you see people at a distance, you admire them, and then when you get around them, you're disappointed. Has that ever happened to you? And you don't say anything, but you think, it's better off when I just knew them at a distance. But it's not that way with Brother and Sister Ryder. They're what they are. They're real. They love Jesus. They love God's people. They love this truth. They're our kind of people. He needs no introduction. He pastors in the city of West Monroe, Louisiana. And uh, God is blessing them tremendously there. But today he has honored us. Pastors don't normally like to be away from their church on Sunday any more than they have to. So brother and sister Ryder, we thank you for making that sacrifice for us today. And we, I mean, she may want to sing this morning. We got the greatest keyboard in Pentecost, so I, she may play. I don't know. Pull an old one out, sister. We don't care. I, hallelujah. And uh, whatever. I don't know, maybe you sing. Do you sing? He sings tenor. 10 or 20 miles from here. <laughs> How many of you love Brother and Sister Ryder? Let's give God a high praise as they come to minister the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. She is getting ready to sing. I'm excited about that. We might get on Facebook Marketplace and look for a truck and trader if we do this too much. We, uh, we evangelized for 14 years. About half of that married, half of that not. Of course, after we met, we spent a little time after getting married, kind of sitting still. But anyhow, after we evangelized for years, I had a curious thing. We'd go to a church, the first couple of services, and there was a consistent conversation you would have with the pastor. And it would go something like, he'd get a bunch of text messages, he'd get a couple calls, and his entire like demeanor would just kind of start lowering on Saturday evening about 8 o'clock right before supper was over. And somehow he'd say, I, I don't, and I just, I just want to warn you, it's not, we're not going to have many people there in the morning. I'm not really sure what. And I never really understood. It was like so consistent. Every church I went to until about three years ago. <laughs> and we took a pastor to a church and my first visiting minister, I was like, ah. This is how they felt all that time. <laughs> so I'm delighted to be here. You have taken our family in with open arms, Beaudry and Gent. We're excited to wake up early on a Sunday morning. And I think some of the first words out of their mouths were, where is Oren? Are we going to go have church with Oren? So I'm glad that they're growing up with godly friends. And it's truly been. These are not just words. Um, and I won't repeat what Brother... Um, elder has said, but we have for many years um, coveted an opportunity to get close to brother and sister elder and their family. Uh, God's timing's perfect, and it was an honor to be with you yesterday. I, I mean that. Those are not by statements and filler. Praise God. But we appreciate the spirit that was here over the last week. Thankful that um, we were able to make all of this happen. Woke up this morning with a message in my heart, and um, could we stand together? My wife's going to sing. I think she's got a team here ready to sing. We'll lift our hands, and one more time. I'm not going to preach long. It's not going to take me long at all. It's not going to take God long at all. 
But I wonder if we could really close the gap this morning by raising our hands one more time. Come on, entreat him. Entreat him to come. It doesn't matter where you are, what angle you had to take to get to the house of God. Come on. Hallelujah. song that I'm positive most of you know please sing along with us
way to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, surely his presence is here. Can you say amen? I want to read to you from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, a very familiar portion of Scripture, beginning in verse 9. What a blessing to be here with this great church, this entire great pastoral family. It's been a pleasure to sit with each of you and experience fellowship of the kingdom in Jesus' name. If you have your Bibles, the word of the Lord says that he came thither unto a cave and he lodged. He spent the night there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous, or actually they would say that word is zealous, for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, look at your neighbor and say, by myself, I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go forth, stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was when Elijah heard. He wrapped his face in his mantle, went out. And stood in the entering end of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him. And again it asked the same question. What dost thou hear, Elijah? I want to preach for a few moments with your help and the help of the Holy Ghost. The silence and thunder of revival. The silence and thunder of revival. Can you clap your hands to the Lord before you're seated this morning? Oh, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. You can be seated. There are two sides to the coin, if I could say, on a Sunday morning of tarrying revival. Not a calendar revival. Not a revival that's got a beginning and an ending. And I'm not even necessarily talking about a revival of a group of people, though I understand the coined phrase and all of the nuances that come to mind when I say that word. But revival can be distilled down into the lifestyle of a single individual, and there are two sides of every tarrying revival, not two different revivals, there's not revival that lasts and revival that um, is cut short. There is only one kind of revival. And if you've experienced spiritual revival, if you've been plucked out of the miry clay, if you've been raised out of the grave and been made to walk in the newness of life, then you could testify, once I get revival, there is absolutely no preference to go back to the death that I came from. There is no revival that has a shelf life. There is no revival that dims. There is no revival that recants by nature of the word and definition itself. We're not talking about the same thing, but there are two sides to real, long-term, lifetime, tarrying revival. Revival is loud. 
There ain't no two ways about it. It didn't take very long. Starting at 11 o'clock, I wasn't here for the kids' service. It probably was the same exact thing. But it didn't take very long if you'd have walked in the building at 11.05 and, and you'd have been a first-time visitor, never even heard the word Pentecost, probably would have pronounced it apostolic if you'd have been asked to. You could have been able to, to give one if no other. There might have been a few different adjectives you would have used, but among crazy and, and a little off their rocker, you probably would have utilized the adjective, they are loud. Revival can be loud. Birthing can be loud. The first thing the doctor hears is a scream of a newborn as they gasp their first breath in life that has been given to them. I'm not afraid of the noise of Pentecost. I'm not afraid of the volume of Acts 2.38. I'm not afraid of the thunder of revival. You ought to make a little noise this morning. Come on. There's a reason it gets loud. Revival is thunderous. There's a reason it it, it, it gets sometimes at our local assembly where my ears will start fuzzing out and shorting off a little bit. Growing up and out, did you ever preach in the old apostolic temple? They had a choir loft that you, you could touch if you were very tall. You could touch the bottom of it. And so you'd get in that altar area and it would just start roaring like Niagara Falls. And as a child, I can remember my ears cutting in and out. Uh, some doctors may not appreciate that, but I'm here to tell you there is a lack outside to revival. Revival's a little in your face. Revival's a little vibrant. Revival's kind of uh, kind of raw sometimes. There's that side of it in Acts chapter 2. It was described as a wind that filled all the house. And the result was that everything that had happened was noised abroad. I like seeing these kids run. I like seeing them scream at the top of their lungs. They're going to run and dance and shout over something. It ought to be in the house of God. Acts chapter 3 found the vibrant, boisterous, flamboyant, if you will, occurrence of a lame man that was healed when the apostles were coming to the temple at the hour of prayer. That's revival. That's loud. That's public. That's in your face. That's on the front page. That's on the stream. First cut and center. And Acts chapter 4 had the persecution. That post-persecution had a prayer meeting that shook the house where they were seated. It was like post-COVID church for the first time. There were people that had never danced that danced the first time we got together. There were people that had never shouted that shouted the first time we got together because they realized the precious nature of being able to gather in freedom. Revival has a loud side to it. And it's needed. It's irreplaceable. It is a fledgling dynamic and a large swath of Pentecost. I want to make sure and, 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 and have, have a good foundation for what I'm about to preach for about 15 or 20 minutes because I am not by any means or stretch of the imagination discounting the vibrant, thunderous side of revival. You can't replace worship like we've had today with anything. It don't matter how pretty your building gets. It don't matter how smooth your singers get. It don't matter how awesome None of it matters. I could give you a list longer than my arm of things that the religious world has tried to use as substitutes for what you felt in this building. That's not revival. This is. I don't need smoke. I don't need lights. I don't need to slide my Corvette sideways and step out in a pair of ripped blue jeans and Stand behind a No, 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 no. I need what we had this morning. My city needs what we had this morning. Pueblo needs what we had this morning. 
irreplaceable, cannot substitute it. However, behind Pentecost, behind the blue screens, stood nine to ten days of prayer and fasting with a Savior that had left them, a promise they didn't fully understand, and a future that was anything but knowledgeable to them. There is silence and thunder to revival. Elijah felt the wind, and it was prominent. Elijah experienced the earthquake, and it was rumbling. The sounds of it reverberated throughout all the countryside. There were no doubt physical and geological shiftings that occurred in that area because of the move of God in its thunderous way. I have to say that the fire was probably wild if it was anything like the wind and anything. It wasn't just a little candle power, but it was a wild fire that people on this side of the country are accustomed to being afraid of. But when the voice came, it was polar opposite. It was the flip side of the coin of what I'm going to preach about this morning. The Bible describes it as still and small. Here in my premier study Bible, it explains that it was a delicate whispering voice. Literally the word steel is gentle. Literally the word small in this connotation means lean or malnourished or dwarfish. And we step out of examples like Elijah's whirlwind. We step out of moments like Sunday nights. We step out of conferences like, like we just did and we get to feeling like hey it's not, what I feel right now is not as loud as it was when Brother Claiborne was preaching. What I feel right now is not as loud. It's not as boisterous. It's not thundering quite like it was when Brother Mitch Elder was singing and, and the bass player was thumping and the drummer was keeping the rest. Some, something's, uh, my faith feels dwarfish. My faith feels malnourished. Pastor, what's wrong with me? Man of God, what happened to me? I'm going to tell you, you're not experiencing backsliding. You're not experiencing what you may think. The devil wants to convince you that it was all just a whimsical smoke and lights, and now the magician has left, and now the lights in the sanctuary are off, and, and now it's not beating a pole. No, 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 no. Don't you listen to that lie from hell. Here's the truth. Revival has two sides to it, and there is an ax to a peru wind that fills the house but there is a moment when the thunder of revival turns silent it just turns silent but the silence is where you generate deep power that creates a tarrying aspect I remember a preacher a great man of God who's probably frequented this pulpit in whose name and voice you would recognize telling me as a younger man I'm telling you and I don't know what his statistic was or how this uh, goes between with your experience with God I don't really know but I remember him telling me uh, seven out of ten times that I hit the prayer room uh, and it's a daily thing for me seven out of ten times uh, it's just a discipline you see all of a sudden you suck a lot of wind and they're like Brother Ryder doesn't get chill bumps. Bro. Oh, surely not my pastor. No, I know how my pastor sounds praying. Can I tell you, sometimes prayer is a discipline. Sometimes prayer, oh, no, 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 we, we don't, we're not going to get used to We don't want it to become, oh, that's not what I'm saying. But sometimes prayer is a routine. When you see me in the prayer room, it doesn't automatically mean I want to be there. When you see preachers are, are old saints of God in the prayer room, uh, here's what the man told me. He said seven out of ten times, uh, it's just a discipline that I do, Sister Elder. But those seven times uh, are worth the trip uh, for the three uh, where heaven opens uh, and God pours out upon me. Uh, I'm here to tell Pueblo, Colorado, uh, a new convert, uh, a young person, uh, or an elder saint of God who's in a brand new season don't give up there is a silent side of revival and don't be squeamish about it 
The deep is quiet. The deep doesn't move easily. You can get in a shallow pool. Anybody ever get in a little, you know, one of them little two foot, three foot pools? You get just a couple of rowdy teenagers in there and they can make it white cap like. You know what I'm talking about. They can get the current going so strong because you can move shallow stuff fast. You can, you can make, you, you can make tumultuous um, atmospheres and things that aren't very deep. But you put those same people in an Olympic-sized pool or a lake, and all of us in this building can't make the deep respond as quickly as we would like to. Because sometimes the deep, we think, oh man, it's going to be dressed up and it's going to be loud and it's going to be vibrant and it's going to be a whirlwind under there. Creatures we've never seen, voices we've never heard, prophecies we've never gained. And we get down there and it's still. And it's actually quiet. And everything seems to slow down, not fast forward. Wait, I thought you told me if I pray, my life would move forward. Oh yeah. Don't mistake the silence of revival for what it's not. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. You can't be squeamish about the silence of revival. You can't get thrown off by the silence of revival. You can't press forward and get into those deep pools where the water don't move quite well. You're saying he's not. No, 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 no. The power of the still voice is as strong as the wind. And the power of the still voice is as strong as the earthquake. And the power of the still voice is as raging as the fire. But he needs you to experience the silence of revival. Because that's where we grow. That's where we're multiplied. That's where moments turn into days and days turn into weeks and weeks turn into decades and lives turn into generation. It's not, yeah, Sunday night, yeah, right, yeah, all this is necessary. I, I don't have time. I wouldn't want to rob your time to read disclaimer over and over again. But while some things are established, while the organ's screaming and the preacher's preaching, some things are established when everything's unplugged and this sanctuary just has a few accent lights on and nobody is here and nobody is shouting with you and nobody else is talking in tongues and you can't be carried with the draft of the man of God. Sometimes it's just quiet, deep, and you struggle to stay awake. I'm just going to preach real. Is this okay? You, you struggle to stay awake and, and you find yourself slipping off. But can I tell you, you will develop a taste for the silence. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. You will develop a taste for a prayer life where you learn how to just sit still. I like to pace. It's the only way I can pray with my boys. They get so distracted. So I'll walk around the sanctuary holding my boys. And I, I preach it. But sometimes I got to just get in the corner and get face down. And I don't want music playing and I don't want a preaching tape going. I do that sometimes. And I don't want I don't want anything. I don't want my Bible in front of me. I don't want a book in front of me. My phone's not in the room. I have no schedule. I'm just alone with the malnourished lean door. Oh, this is not what I signed up for. I didn't sign up for some dwarfish. That's literally the word, small. I didn't sign up for some midget prayer life. Tell you there is a side to the silence of revival. That if we don't learn, we will constantly ride the wave of the thunder until it peters out and then we'll backslide. We'll ride the conference wave, but how many, how many backslide in October? We got past, we got past double portion and, and we got past uh, summit and we, we got out of peak and, and we got past this conference and we saw our friends and we cried, we really cried and we spoke in tongues, we really spoke in tongues and we shouted and we shouted under the auspice of the Holy Ghost. It was all real. It was all God. It was all revival. But that's not where our mission came from. And that's not where our ministry comes from. And that's not where generations are born. 
That's not where prayer lives are built. That's not where foundations are settled. That's not where sacrifice is made. Daniel's prayer was not a protest to the injustice of the day. He didn't get all up in arms when they signed the legislature saying, you can't, you can't. Oh, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll show them. I'll go pray through. No, no, no. The Bible says he just kept doing what he always does. He didn't go re-architect his house. He didn't go remodel his house so he could get, I'll show them, I'll put a window facing me. No, no, no. He just did what he always did. With his windows open to Jerusalem, they were already open to Jerusalem. He already had a prayer life. That's what the pattern is. He already had a relationship in the deep, still, silent parts. And when the legislature came, when COVID came, when the disease came, when cancer came, when the car wreck came, I just kept going back to the south. I didn't need the thunder. Great. But guess what? People that come to the house of God who've got the silence of prayer, if the electricity's off, we can have the same kind of church. Bishop, am I being plain enough this morning? I like We have church just like this. It's not what I'm saying, but you can't live off this. I live at about 400 feet elevation. But it don't matter where you live. You can live in Pueblo, Colorado. Nothing grows on the mountaintops. Oh, it's fun. Oh, it's a help. It rejuvenates. It does things in your bloodstream. It, it really does. There are physiological changes that are positive that happen to you. And, and, and you, I, let me just say I, my wife, not so much. I gotta have it. I gotta go to the mountains every every once in a while. Just drive. I'll go bonkers. She's gotta go to the beach. They say opposites attract. Hallelujah. But but there is one thing you can't you can't live up there. You can't live up there. There are no life sustaining elements up there. There is perception. There is, let me, let me, let me parallel. There is prophetic vista. There is vision. There is a blast of cool air that refreshes and lifts after a long weekend. But what really sustains us is not the thunder of revival. What really sustains us is the silence. This is profoundly exemplified by Jacob and his wives in the book of Genesis. One was vibrant. One was attractive. One was thunderous. That was Rachel. Rachel was beautiful. Rachel was easy on the eye. It was easy to come. It was, I, I don't know. I'm sure Pueblo's not like this, but we have a much larger Sunday night than Wednesday night prayer. I, I know you don't handle that. I know that, and that's okay. I'm just testifying. We have here, where I pastor, we have a much larger crowd on Sundays when the music's plugged in than we do on Wednesday nights when we have prayer meeting. Because Rachel's easy on the eye. And even if I don't like what he's preaching, Bishop's a good preacher. And even if it's not my favorite song, Brother Mitch is a great singer. It's, it's easier on the eye on Sundays. You, you, don't, you don't understand what I'm talking about, don't you, brother? Rachel's beautiful. It's vibrant. It's attractive. I'll work for Rachel. I'll drive across town. I'll fix my hair. I'll duck back in and look in the mirror just to make sure I'm all together. But it can thunder in Denver, and I'll stay home from prayer meeting just in case. Oh, God, it's way quieter than I thought it would be. 
can I tell you, Rachel is beautiful. And I don't want to live without Rachel. I'm going to marry Rachel. I'm going to work for Rachel. I'm going to sacrifice for Rachel. I don't plan on substituting for Rachel. I don't plan on replacing. No, 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 no. But let me help you understand. Leah, Leah, although Rachel is attractive and Leah is, Leah's the silent side. Leah's, ah, she's behind the scenes. She's lights off in the sanctuary. She's Monday after passing the torch. You feel what I'm saying? She's an empty church building with nobody helping me pray. Uh, and Rachel, no, hold on. Let's, uh, I really liked it when he was preaching about Rachel, brother. I was a lot better. I mean, Benjamin comes from Rachel, son of authority. And, and we like apostolic, demon casting, shingle ripping authority, don't we? Oh, yeah. But while Rachel's giving you Benjamin, Leah's given you five times the produce. Because where Rachel produces one, Leah produces five. It's okay to have two sons from Rachel. But for every two sons from Rachel, you better have ten sons from Leah. For every two sons from Rachel, from thunder, from vibrance... You better have 10 sons from Leah. Rachel's where you get your power, but Leah's where you get your multiplication. Hey, if you're waiting on it to get any better than this, it might not. You ought to go ahead and jump in. It's about as good as it's going to get. I'm here to tell you one simple, not profound. It's nothing you're going to write down. But if you are sick of the merry-go-round, I've got your answer. Learn how to love Leah. Rachel will give you Joseph with a vibrant coat of many colors, but when it's all over and they put you in the ground, baby, they don't put you in the ground with the organ. They don't put you in the ground with your youth group. They don't put you in the ground with a choir at peak. They don't put you in the ground with the reels of life. They put you in the ground with what you produce with Leah. It's never been profound or any more profound. Musicians, please come. I'm really done. And then, then sitting just a, just a few weeks ago, I buried my mother sitting in the room just days before she passed. She was sitting there, and I'm not trying to be too plain. And it's anything but sacrilegious. She was a holy woman. But she had three or four nightgowns that, that, that hospice would, would rotate out. You know, they have to come. She was bedridden for many months and, and non-communicative, not really living much of a life with a dementia that had attacked her. And, and she, was a, she was a vibrant woman. She was a praying woman. She was a, she was a beautiful woman. She was the life of the party. Hilarious. Just like to party. It's where I get that side of me from. Up, up early and up late. Just, you know, how some people are. And, and she was vibrant. She liked color. She liked the color yellow. She, I mean, just sunshine everywhere she went. But at those last moments, brother, brother Elder, she was reduced. And she had a, an old nightgown and a little worn out tennis ball that would kind of help her not fidget so much. She was in a little room, not the size of this portion, just, just this little tiny portion where you're sitting, and she hadn't left for over a year. And Rachel, Rachel was long gone. Hadn't been in a church service in a long time. Hadn't raised her hands to pray in a long time. Hadn't shouted. And she had a strong alto voice. You could hear it across the parish. She had a strong voice. Hadn't sang in years. I mean years. Hadn't helped in the fellowship hall. Hadn't gotten dinners together for funerals. Wasn't the youth committee leader. None of that. Hadn't done none of that. Rachel was gone. Rachel had been dead for a long time. But there was a little lady that would watch her at nighttime in case anything happened. And she said, Brother, Brother Ryder, I was praying for your mom last night. And I... The entire atmosphere in the room shifted. She said, I got so embarrassed by what was going on that I had to get up and walk out because she said, like that, all of a sudden, I was a new convert at the altar and Sister Pam was praying for me. She said her spirit was praying and this lady's going through a trial of her life. She said her spirit was praying for me. Rachel's long gone. But when you get to the point of life where you're fixing to go in the grave, they bury you with Leah. They bury you with whatever you've produced 
with Leah. Ultimately, you'll be married to both Rachel and Leah. I'm not going to take the time to qualify that biblically. You understand what I'm preaching, don't you? Ultimately, we buck and we snart on Sundays. We pray and we fast until the next. But can I tell you, like Laban, your heavenly father is trying to get you to develop a relationship with Leah first. And so you come to this altar and you repent and you wake up in the morning. And oh, surprise of surprises. It's not Rachel. It's Leah that I'm left with. Can you, can you learn how to love Leah? Can you learn how to love reading even when it's the book of Leviticus and just being satisfied with the fact that the living word of God is? Can you learn how to love Leah? Preacher, does it get any easier? I've got a question to answer your question with. Have you learned how to love Leah? Preacher, I've been in this for just six or eight months, maybe nine or ten, maybe a year or two, and, and I, I feel like I'm still fighting. Can I, can I ask you a question? Are you just in love with Rachel? Silence and the thunder of revival don't give up the thunder come tonight and let's make it thunder musicians I'm begging you come tonight don't let don't let don't let me don't really please don't misinterpret I say come let's make it thunder let's make it thunder but he don't come from the thunder he don't come from the lineage of authority he don't come from the lineage of Joseph Christ comes through Leah, not Rachel. And if you want the next generation to have him, then you better learn. You better learn. You better, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be, you better learn how to have a relationship with Leah. You better learn how to love Leah. Young gentlemen, young ladies, you better learn how to love Leah. You better learn how to love some of the silence, the deep place where nobody else, nobody, no the sounds, no the words. See, we don't like that preaching because it's too abstract. It's hard to hear that kind of preaching and really respond because it's so effervescent. You reach for it and it just fades. And I'm going to tell you, your opinion is coming from an addiction. To Rachel, you were drunk on the attractiveness and the beauty and the bounty and the thunder of Rachel. But the Savior's coming through Leah, and the foundation's coming through Leah, and the priest, the priesthood, the priestliness in your life is coming through Leah. You ain't getting it through, Rachel. I don't care how well you play, how many times you come. I don't care if you find you an apostolic church that rips and roars every night of the week. And when you can't find one, you bury yourself in black gospel and HGR. It don't matter. You ain't getting some things through, Rachel. Some things only come through Leah. Please stand with me, singers. Come if you feel to. I know what's easy on our culture, but I'm not as interested in what's easy on our culture. If you'd please bow your heads, close your eyes with me. it do my heart just fine if only one or two came up. I don't have any problem with that, so please don't think you're placating this preacher. I just wonder if there's anybody in the building who's woken up. 
and looked around the tent of your life and realized after all this work, after that huge wedding, after all that celebrating, and the only thing I have to live with is Leah. Son, learn how to love Leah. Honey, learn how to love Leah. Brand new saint of God, learn how to love that thing that seems malnourished. Well, it's just not, this is not as pretty. It's just not as, it don't sound quite, this doesn't tinkle in my ears. I'm telling you, you'll have Rachel. Rachel ain't going anywhere, but learn how to love Leah. Silence and it's by myself and it's in the back room. Leah happens in a closet. And then those that learn how to do the closet relationship, God rewards you in a season of Rachel openly. not built in the altar. Character's not built while she's singing. Character's built when you're the only one that knows what you're doing. Character is praying in your prayer closet when nobody's looking over your shoulder. You can pray for people when your prayers are going unanswered. You can lay hands on others and pray down blessings when you need God to open the door for you.
never stop, you never stop working. Even when I can't see it, you work. Even when I can't feel it, you work. You never stop, you never stop working. Why don't we thank Him again for the moving of the Holy Ghost this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I think we can do better than that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Please remember this afternoon, there is Spanish outreach service right here in the sanctuary beginning at 2.30 p.m. Also, there will be music practice this evening at 4.30 p.m. Prayer will begin at 5.30 p.m. And service will begin this evening at 6 p.m. So let's do what we got to do. Let's be back in the house of the Lord this evening. And let's remember the word of the Lord that God gave us. The next time it gets quiet, God's not done. God's not done. God bless you. Love one another. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.